Um, well, um, thank you for coming. Thank you for the invitation. Um, so for as, a, as an introduction, right? So I'm giving two talks. The one today will be about talking about how do you computationally analyze online media and how do you think of social media? How do you build uh, computational models of information flow? That's for today. And tomorrow will be more about networks, network structure, community detection, corporate restructures in networks, um, and so on. So that's how this, um, they'll be completely different. Uh, uh, the same part will be the name, the uni affiliation, and my little uh, pine tree. Uh, the rest will be different. Okay, good. So here's here's what I want to talk about today. Um, and let's uh, let's all look at this uh, this one because here's my head. Okay. So um, we'll be talking today about sort of how information flows through online media and how how it reaches us as individuals, right? And sort of you have this kind of dichotomy of how how the information gets to us, right? One, one is that we receive information through our personal communication or through our personal social networks, and the other one is sort of through the transmissions or through due to the, in some sense, influence of the mainstream media, right? So really what we have is we have that, uh, this, these two processes going on, and the question is how does the information transmitted by the, by the media interact with the personal influence coming from the social networks, right? And really what you have is this kind of tension or this kind of two different kinds of effects, right? Like um, you have the global effects. I can take that. Oh, uh, yeah, it's all good. Thanks. Thank you. Okay. Um, so you have um, this kind of what I, what I mean like global effects where it's almost like mainstream media comes and, you know, pours the information on top of us and we get all, um, all overloaded by it. And then we also have this kind of local effects that come from our social ties, right? And um, what 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 I want to um, to motivate this talk with that it was traditionally very hard for us to capture the structure of these two processes uh, going on and um, interacting um, with one another. But what we have today that allows us to get some insights into um, into these kinds of questions is that we have the what I will call the explosion of online social and mainstream media, right? So what we have today is basically we have. Um, all kinds of different media leave some kind of digital traces or digital footprints on the web, and we can go and collect um, collect the data, right? And really, what we have is also we have the whole the whole stack filled up, right? Sort of from kind this kind of traditional big um, uh, media media sites to uh, blogs, either personal or professional, all the way down to this kind of microblogging, uh, Twitter and so on, right? Sort of the whole spectrum from the, the big mainstream media things to small personal kind of messaging, it is all on the web, right? So the whole from left to right, it's all there, right? So, um, and using, collecting this kind of uh, massive amounts of data, it allows us to study this interaction between the, what I call the sort of the global effects, the mainstream media side of things, and the local effects coming from much more, um, in some sense, personalized or link-based kind of um, um, communication or um, media services, right? So really, um, I think the difference that that was brought by the by the by the social media to the to the web or to our information consumption is the following, right? So really, this traditional dichotomy between you know talking to your neighbor versus buying the newspaper, I would say today is evaporating, right? So really, this this local versus global that I think this boundary got uh, much more uh, smoothed out. The other thing is the speed at which media is reporting stories um, has intensified, right? It's not that you are you are on this kind of 24-hour news cycle where every morning you go get your newspaper and you learn what happened in the last 24 hours. Um, these things today are much more fast-paced. And then the other, another important thing is that sort of today the information sort of reaches us in real time and in very small um, increments. And maybe the best example of this thing is, is, um, uh, is uh, the Twitter information network. Right? So really, if this is how the, the media changed today, the question is, how should, how should we change our understanding of information consumption um, and the role of social, ne social, um, social networks? Right? So really, what do we have today? Right? So today, basically, we have these bits of information that are, that are coming continuously from real-time sources conveyed by networks. Right? And what we need is we need new ways how to think about how information is being uh, consumed, right? And here, here, here are sort of two. There are two pieces to this first question. One is what is the role um, of networks and how the information diffuses through them. And then the second one is how are so, how are stories um, assembled together from small pieces and how their attention or popularity raises and decays uh, over time, right? 
And then the, um, um, the, the second thing is um, we also need new ways to realize this uh, real dynamic real-time flow of, in, um, in, of information through networks. And here what, what we will talk about is how do you talk about fragments of information that travel through the system and sort of pot potentially mutate and change um, over time or how does the sentiment towards them change as they, as they spread through some kind of um, network or a medium, right? So basically this is, here's the plan what I want to talk about um, today. And please feel free to stop me, ask questions and so on, right? So what I will talk about is how do you analyze mechanisms for the real time spread of uh, information in online networks? And here are sort of the three questions that I'd like to get to, right? So the first one is how can I build machinery if I, if, even if I talk about how information spreads, then I need to be able to build machinery that is able to track individual pieces of information so that I can see how, uh, where they go, right? So that I can actually capture them, right? Then what I will talk to you about is uh, models for basically predicting the adoption of information or um, the spread of it through networks. And then uh, the, sec the last thing I'll be talking about is how could you actually go that, that in, in a sense many times you don't have access to the underlying network over which something is spreading. Can you go and infer the network so that and, that, and then look at the network in order to understand um, different roles, uh, let's say media plays in um, diffusion or adoption of different kinds of information, right? So those are sort of um, the three things I want to get to. And the way I will go about this talk is basically uh, for every question I will show you a model or a technique. Hopefully we'll all be able to understand what the model is doing. I usually won't tell you how you fit the model. It's, um, and then I'll show you the results, okay? So there will be a bit of piece, a little piece that I won't tell you, but usually I'll have like pointers up here to the papers where the, the technical bit of how you actually fit the stuff to the data um, works. But things will be very easy, okay? So um, here is, here's what we will be, what, what we were doing or what we are doing. Um, so in principle, right, because all this media, social media, mainstream media is on the web, I can go and collect uh, all of it. And uh, what we've been doing for since 2008 is that we've been collecting about 35 million articles, blog posts, uh, Twitter, uh, Twitter uh, posts uh, per day. So we are getting about 50 gigabytes of stuff per day. Um, and um, we've been doing this with a, with a, a company called Spinner. And basically what, what, what we are getting is we basically get everything that Google News has, which is around 20,000 mainstream media sources, plus around 4 million uh, blogs, plus around 10 to 15% of, uh, of all the tweets. Um, and we have this for the last three years, right? And now if this is sort of my data source to the, to the online information and online media, the first thing I want to answer or the first thing I need to do to be, before I can start studying these things is to ask, okay, what if I want to fl um, trace the flow of information? The question is, what are the basic units of information, right? What sort of what pieces of information propagate between, uh, let's say, uh, nodes? And here by nodes, I can mean users, media sites, things like that, right? And I will show, I will, the way, the way you can think about, about this is really that what I would like to do is I would like to find some kind of units of information, whatever this means at the moment, I'll be very concrete in the next two slides, that basically, right, that correspond to uh, events or articles that, that have interesting temporal patterns associated to them and that I can handle at this uh, 50 gigabytes um, of stuff per day or, you know, terabyte scale if I want to look at um, um, a few months of data, right? Yeah. Yuri, you, you, you mentioned there that 10 to 15 percent of tweets, is it a specific percent and does that, will that matter for the rest of this? I will ignore Twitter completely from my talk. Great. So no Twitter. Uh, we look completely focus on mainstream media articles and blog posts, okay? Uh, but yeah. Uh, okay, good. So um, if I want to, so how do I think about information flows or how do I think about information flows if I think about uh, online media? Then, then what I'll show you here is a little, little graph that hopefully will get us uh, on a common page. What do I mean by flow, right? So you could think that there is, you know, some obscure technological story appearing somewhere on the web, right? And then sort of some, um, you know, small technological blog picks up this story and maybe creates a hyperlink to it, right? So I could say that this information here now propagated uh, to this particular site or to this particular 
um, particular user, right? And then in terms of the information flow, you know, you could imagine that this now gets picked up by uh, semi-professional or technolo technology oriented sites and then um, you know, the mainstream media sites pick this thing up and then um, the information percolates to the rest of the population. So really, if this is some kind of cartoonish picture of the process that I'd like to study, the question is, how can I get, how can I, you know, select like a small piece of text that would allow me to, tra to trace it uh, through this kind of graph. And we will call this graph a cascade. We'll call it an information cascade, okay? So that's basically the idea. And what I'll show you today are two approaches how to do this. The first one will be how you can take lots of blog posts and actually exploit the, the hype, the linking structure of the blogosphere to go and ex explicitly extract this kind of graphs, right? So one approach will be based completely on use, the use of hyperlinks, while the other one I'll be also talking about will be co used, we'll call that one meme tracking, and that will be completely based on uh, uh, sort of identifying small, uh, pieces of text and then tracing those pieces of text over um, millions of articles, okay? And what I won't talk about today is Twitter, um, and on Twitter you do things a bit differently, okay? So that's, that's basically the idea. So here is the idea for using hyperlinks, right? So imagine our setting now is the blogosphere, right? So I have blogs, imagine my uh, squares are different blogs, and um, then every block has a number of posts, right? So imagine my circles are, are those, those posts, right? And what posts also do, they link to each other, right? So I have these hyperlinks, I have the, the edges, right? And the hyperlink always points to the, to the younger post to the, older, to the older one, right? So I can't link to the future, I can only link to the past, right? But what I can do if I go and collect a bunch, a bunch of uh, uh, blog posts, what I can do is I can then go and trace these hyperlinks in the di reverse direction, right? And then sort of use this as a proxy for the information flow. So what do I mean by that is, for example, that I could say <coughs> I have a blog post here that got cited by this blog post um, uh, from block two, number two, right? So if I trace um, these hyperlinks in the reverse direction, what I could say is that the information started here, then this guy linked to it, so it transferred in this direction, then transferred here and transferred there, right? So I was able now to identify an information cascade, right? And the information sort of transfers in the opposite direction of the hyperlink, because if this blog links to that other blog, uh, that other, this blog post links to that other blog post, then there must have been a good reason for that to happen. So I would argue that this is a a reasonable way to trace information uh, spread online. Of course, it has a bunch of problems in a sense that uh, many times people don't create hyperlinks to the sources of their information, that mainstream media articles don't uh, link to other articles and so on. So, so you can think of this as sort of a high precision, low recall kind of method. But it's still kind of useful because you actually you get out exactly the information cascade uh, that occurred there. And if you have problems with missing data, we also have methods to take care of that, but uh, not part of this talk. Okay, so what I can do now, I can go and collect um, several uh, tens of millions of these uh, blog posts. I can, uh, uh, I can see, I have these time ordered uh, hyperlinks in them. I can trace now uh, these hyperlinks in the reverse direction. And I can now go and just topologically count what kind of cascade uh, graphs, what kind of graphs of information propagation do I have. And that's sort of the thing um, that I want to show you next, right? So, so what we did here is we took um, 10 million blog posts, we identified um, 350,000 different cascades, and then we just counted them, meaning counted the ones that are topologically different. And what I'm showing you here is um, different cascades, right? So the information always starts at the top and then propagates from top to the bottom, and the direction, uh, the edges here are pointing in the direction of the hyperlink. So the information spreads in the reverse direction of the of the edge direction, right? And um, I count them, meaning I count how often did this this kind of cascade appear versus that kind, and so on. And I'm showing you them in the decreasing direction, uh, de decreasing order of the frequency. And what is interesting is. Um, just looking at this is that basically most of the cascades are very shallow, right? You get these kind of st stars if you like, right? But then the other interesting thing that you get from this is, is that um, certain, uh, certain structures are more, uh, more, uh, more, um, more common than, than the others, right? So for example, you have, you have G7 um, and G9, right? So this is, you have a split first and then one of the, one of the, one of the articles propagated versus 
first the propagation and then the split, right? So you get this kind of very interesting relationship between the structure of the information uh, flow and the topology uh, that it creates, sort of the cascade uh, <coughs> it creates, right? So that's what this kind of approach of tracing hyperlinks allows you to do. I will, at the end of the talk, I'll come back to this if, when, I'll, when, I'll, when I'll talk about um, when, you talk, when you can start talking about also not just how the information flows, but how does the sentiment associated with that piece of information, how does that change as something is propagating through networks? So I'll come to this at the, at, the, at, uh, um, at, the very, at the very end of the talk, okay? So this is the first way how you can think about um, tracing information flows. The, the second way how you can think about information flows is, is this thing what we, what we called meme tracking. And it's sort of super simple, right? So the idea is, what, I, what do I want to do? I want to extract like um, short textual uh, segments that travel relatively unchanged through many articles, right? Sort of I want to have some kind of genetic signatures of information. And the super simple idea how to do this is just say, let's go and extract um, pieces of text that appear inside quotation marks, right? And the first interesting thing is that there is actually quite a lot of quotes. In our data set, we have more than 1.25 quotes per document. Um, so basically you get one, more than one quote per document in our data set. And the other thing is why quotes are a good idea is that basically journalists like, especially in US, they like to use quotes a lot. Um, they tend to follow iterations of a story as the story evolves. And the last thing that's really nice about quotes is it's very, you can very easily attribute them, right? For every quote, you know who said it, where they said it, and when they said it, right? It's kind of very descriptive. It's easier to, much easier to work with quotes than to work with named entities, right? If you see a spike in the mentions, mentions of a particular named entity, you have no clue why that happened. If you see a, a, a mention, a spike in the mentions of a particular quote, it's much easier for you to figure out uh, what led to that. Okay, so that's basically our idea. So we just go uh, through text and you know extract pieces that are between quotation marks. And the first thing you realize is that these quotes, even though they are quotes, they mutate quite a lot. They change quite a lot. <laughs> so what I'm trying to show you here is just a, a, a graph of different variants of a particular quote where um, you know there are a few misspellings. People make quotes shorter, make them longer. Um, they take this long quote and chop it up into different pieces. And these are different variants of, uh, of, the, of the same quote, right? So really, the way I can think about this is that I have a single piece of information that mutates uh, as it spread through the network, right? So our first goal is to go and identify muta uh, mutational variants of a single quote. And the way we can think about this is the following. So the way we can think about this is to say that um, for now, just for the sake of this example, my letters, think of them as words, right? So every, every note here is a different quote uh, composed of um, a set of letters or a set of words, right? So what I'd like to do now <laughs> is I'd like to be, go and be able to identify all the mutational variants of, a, of the same quote. And the way, the way I will think about this is, um, is the following. I will create this graph where I will connect uh, quotes if they are if they are uh, similar and what do I mean similar is if one quote is approximately included in another quote right so I have this ABC pointing to ABCD why because ABC is a substring of ABCD um, I also have um, uh, BCD be included in this BDX CY uh, why because this is approximately included here right up to a small edit distance this could have evolved from here, right? So what you can do this now is to create this kind of directed acyclic graph where every, every, the intuition is that every quote says, okay, who could my parents be, right? What are sort of the quotes that I could have evolved from? And the, the implicit assumption you are making here is that when you evolve, you evolve in a way that you only can lose stuff. You never grow, you just get smaller. You get more specific as you evolve, right? So sort of shorter quotes point to longer, and you can put also uh, weights on the edges by how likely do you think a particular quote has evolved from some other particular quote, right? So now, what is our goal once we created this graph? Our goal now is to identify these uh, quote clusters, right? These clusters where everything evolved from the same parent, from the same, you know, grand, grand, grandfather or whatever, right? So the way, what do I want to do is I want to do the following, right? I have this di directed acyclic graph of this approximate uh, quote inclusion. And what I want to do is I want to delete the minimal total edge weight such that the connected components I get from this graph will, e each of them will have a single sync node, 
right? So um, if I show you um, how to do this, in this particular example, if this, if this would be the edges that I would delete, right? Then I get connected components. Some of them are trivial, but either way, each connected component has a single root node, right? Sort of a single sync node, right? It has a single uh, mother quote from which everything evolved, right? So now I can use these different connected components um, <coughs> as some kind of clusters of mutational variants of the same piece of information. And um, in, in our data that we used, um, we took all the quotes that had at least four words and that appeared at least 10 times uh, li sort of literally letter by letter. Uh, we were working with 22 million quotes, so we had a graph on 22 million nodes. Um, then it turns out that um, DAC partitioning is uh, MP hard, so you have to come up with efficient heuristics how to do this. Um, there is a nice sort of top-down heuristic of how to, part how to do this partitioning. And at the end, basically, you end up with 35,000 different uh, quote clusters. And what do I mean by non-trivial is uh, where you have at least two uh, different versions of the, um, of the quote. So where you have sort of two different mutational variants. And um, the first thing that happens out of this is that you can go and create this kind of beautiful plots where you say, uh -huh, here is time, this is number of mentions, and just, um, you know, um, I plot what is the number of times a particular quote has been mentioned. This is now a bit old. This is before the last US presidential election. And if you remember, you know, um, this makes lots of sense. But it's sort of not my goal here to tell you how the, the 2008 US presidential election campaign went and um, what happened during it. But for example, this is the democratic um, 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 uh, uh, where they decided who the dem democratic candidate will be. This was the Republican convention. And then you have sort of, you know, our economy is strong and then everything was in danger and here's the election, right? But that's basically the, the idea. What you get by just processing terabytes of data and just plotting what comes out and you already get quite a lot of insight. The second interesting thing you can do with this data is that you can now, for example, use Google News to label every website as a mainstream media site or as a blog, right? So everything that appears on Google News we will call mainstream media and everything else we will call a blog. And in, in the data we used here, we had 20,000 uh, sites that are indexed by Google News. We call the mainstream media sites and they contribute around 44% of all the articles in our data set. And then 1.6 million blogs, in our data set, they contribute the other half of the data. So basically, you have these highly active mainstream media sites and sort of l many, many, uh, many, many more blogs. But at the end, the amount of stuff they create is about the same. And what you can now do is to say, OK, let me create this graph where here is time, here is the volume, number of mentions, normalized, doesn't matter. Uh, zero is when the information, a particular quote, is the most popular. But now I, I, I plot the number of mentions for the mainstream media sites, because I know who's mainstream media. And I can plot the number of mentions for blogs, because again, I know who the blogger, who the blogger is. And there are two in, in, uh, interesting things that come out of this, right? So the first thing that comes out of this is that mainstream media sites tend to t mention information about 2.5 hours before the blogosphere does, right? Sort of the peak on the red. Um, is 2.5 hours sooner than the peak in the green. The other interesting thing is that mainstream media sites are very quick at forgetting about stories, while blogosphere sort of talks about things much longer, right? So what you could go and conclude from this is that, you know, mainstream media guys are the ones that come up, sort of bring up the information, and then the blogosphere follows and just discusses, right? But actually, there is another way how to look at this. What you can also do is you can do the following thing. Again, the same x-axis. Um, you guys can, can you read this? Is it too small? No? Good. Okay, so time, uh, hours, zero is the most popular. But what I'm sort of the time where the quote was the most popular. And um, my y-axis now is the fraction of mentions that came from the blogosphere, right? So high means the, the blog, uh, the quote was heavily mentioned on the blogosphere. And low means uh, the, the, the quote was heavily mentioned on the, uh, on the mainstream media side, right? And right now this is at 56%. Why? Because 56% of all the quotes come from the, uh, from the blogosphere and 44 come from the mainstream media side, right? And then as what you see here is the following, right? You have a, you have a small peak which says that the attention to the information swayed towards the, the blogosphere, then it goes to the mainstream media and then back to the blogosphere, right? And what this tries to tell you is that there are sort of two different populations of the bloggers, right? You have the early bloggers, you have the late bloggers, and you have the mainstream media sites, 
right? And actually, if you go and look at the data a bit more, and actually what you can go to do is for every, for every different domain name, for every media site, you can go and classify them. When do, you, when do they tend to mention information relative to the peak popularity of the information? So, you know, 23 means they tend to mention information 23 hours before it reaches the peak popularity. And a positive value here would mean that they, they, uh, they tend to mention the information after it reached peak popularity. And what I did here is I just sorted these guys, here's the rank by, the, by their leg, right? Sort of negative means they, 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 they are leading the, the crowd, right? And what you see from this is that sort of the same conclusion that came from the previous plot, right? You have, you have the, the, the top 10 ranked are all professional blogs, sort of liberal US professional blogs. And then, um, you know, the mainstream media sites, um, they are still leading the, the peak popularity of things for around 10 hours. But they are behind the professional bloggers, right? And then, you know, all the other bloggers who are mostly reading these guys come and talk about things. So we get this second spike uh, on the blogosphere. Yes. So what is the reported column? Indicate? Sorry? What is the reported column indicate? Is that the number of quotes? Oh, uh -huh. sure. What is this? Good question. So uh, this thing is I took 100 most popular quotes. And then I just asked how many of the 100 most popular quotes did a particular website mention? So it's almost like coverage, if you think, right? And you see that you know these big guys like CNN mentioned 72 of them, or Washington Post mentioned 78, while um, I don't know Dig, there was 50 of them were on Dig, um, or you know Talk Left mentioned only 32 of them. It's just some kind of notion of um, coverage. Okay, so that's one one thing, one kind of insight you can get. The other kind of insight you can get was comes from was um, came from the collaboration we had with the um, uh, Pew Foundation's project on the excellence in journalism and they were interested in what is the media, uh, the media coverage of the current economic cr crisis and um, the way the way they thought about this was to say okay let's go and identify these quoted phrases and now let's see wh who mentioned them and uh, when and with what volume Right? And then they were trying, and what was interesting that came from here is that basically it was mostly Barack Obama who got the, who got the attention with regard to particular um, phrases, to, uh, with regard to the particular, um, um, a particular issue. The only exception here is this New York Post cartoon. I don't know if you remember, it was kind of um, uh, controversial. They, there is these two cops, they shoot a monkey, and then they say, we'll have to find someone else to write the next stimulus bill. And they, have to re they had to retract and apologize and so on, right? But again, all I want to show you is that by, by tracing these quotes and collecting together mutational variants of quotes, you can get quite some insight into uh, what's going on in the online media, uh, sort of more at the global scale. What I want to do next is uh, keep moving on. Um, and I want to talk now, basically really ask, right, if this was the graph that I showed you before, the question is, how does this information attention or information popularity, how does it rise and decay? So the way I will be thinking about this is the following. I will just say, I have this, I will call it an item I, and I will just mean it's a piece of information. So it could be a quote. If I would be working with Twitter, I could say this is the frequency of the, of the mentions of the URL on Twitter and so on. And then I'll have this quantity x sub i of t, which is what I will call volume. It's just the number of times this, this piece of information i was mentioned during time period t, right? So during a particular hour. And the way I can think about volume is really number of mentions. I could also talk, uh, call it attention or I, I could call it popularity. And my first question is what are the typical, let's call them classes of shapes of these um, volume, volume curves of different pieces of information, okay? And so here is the first thing I want to do. All I want to do is the following, right? You give me this kind of time series of time versus number of mentions of different pieces of information, and I'd like to be able to cluster this time series, right? So if you give me four different curves, I'd like to be able to find two clusters and say, I have the first type of a shape and I have a second type of shape, right? Sort of this kind of single peak and I have two that have two peaks, right? That's what I'd like to do. Um, the way I can do this is basically just a far to formulate um, uh, a simple clustering problem, right? There is um, just um, one, one in, there is one interesting twist to this, right? So what I would like to do is I'd like to cluster time series and find the cluster centers. I'd like to find sort of for every cluster, I'd like to find what is the representative shape for that cluster. Um, and now, if I want to do clustering, I need to be able to compare two different time series, right? And um, there is, so I need a distance metric between two time series. 
And the distance metric has, has, has to have two properties for this to make sense. The first one is that my distance metric has to be invariant to scaling, right? So if I have two time series and one is just the scaled version of the other, so one is multiplied version of the other, I want these two to be at distance zero. And then the other thing I'd like to have is if I have two time series and one is just shifted, time shifted version of another, I'd like this to be at the distance zero, right? So what I'd like to do is I'd like to do the following. I say if I have a distance between two time series x sub i and x sub j, then this is really, it's like a Euclidean distance where I go and try to find the best scaling factor and the best translation that makes the whole distance as small as possible, okay? So I want to be, if, if it's invariant to scaling, then I get to, I get to choose this scaling parameter and the distance will be small. And to this, I have the, the sort of the time shift parameter here that makes the whole distance small. Um, so this is my sort of funny uh, distance metric, but what is cool is that you can actually use this distance metric and explicitly find the best a and q for every pair of um, for every pair of time series, and you can sort of derive this kind of funny version of uh, k-means clustering that we call spe uh, k-spectral centroid clustering. We call it spectral because there is an interesting matrix, and you arrive to an interesting eigenvalue problem. But the bottom line is you can cluster your time series using this kind of uh, distance function. And now what you can do is you can start looking at what the clusters mean. So the first thing you find is that, this that there are six different clusters. And here they are, right? So this is uh, time um, and this is some notion of volume. It's really normalized. So it doesn't really matter. The, the units don't really matter. Um, for this, we were using one year of the mean tracker data, which was 172 million documents and uh, 340 million uh, quotes. And um, what I show you here is the six different clusters. Um, you see that sort of I have three that have a single peak, and I have then three that are um, uh, a, bit, uh, a bit different. The other thing I also show you in this plot is that for, um, for um, a set of websites, we actually went and labeled them. Are they newspapers, professional blogs, TV stations, news agencies, or personal blogs, right? And now what I show you here is for all the pieces of information that, that belong to this cluster, I show you at what point in time do blogs come into the, when do they tend to mention information, when do professional blogs tend to mention information, and so on, right? You get the idea. So for all the, all the, all the quotes that, be, that have this ki a particular kind of a temporal pattern, I compute what is the average time when particular media tends to mention quotes with that particular signature. And what do you see from this, right? So this is kind of cluster number zero, right? All come at the, at the top, nothing interesting. But then interesting things start, start happening once, once the peak is getting more asymmetric. And here where I have this kind of very asymmetric where there is zero, 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 and then attention all of a sudden arises and quickly decays, this is sort of something that is driven by news agencies, right? News agencies are first, then it's newspapers and blogs come very late, right? But for example, if I want something that peaks on the first day and gets a, a higher peak on the second day, this is something that is led by, by the blogosphere. It's sort of blogs tend to mention these things first. Or similar is if I want something or when I get things that have a single peak but then sort of slow decay, right? There is significant volume even after, um, after a day. Again, this, is, uh, this kind of quotes are most, are the discussion of them starts on the blogosphere and then it's TV stations, um, <coughs> Uh, newspapers and news agencies are very late, right? So what 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 does this what, sort of what can you take out of this is that depending on when different media media types mention a particular piece of information, you will get very different um, um, volume curves for a particular piece of information. And the reason why this is interesting is because it tells it sort of suggests that um, that each different um, uh, media type adds adds a component to the whole uh, popularity of a particular piece of information. So why why am I saying this is because what I can do now I can ask a different I can build on this intuition that sort of each media type sort of adds adds something to to the to the to the overall popularity of a particular uh, news phrase. So what I will do now is I'll ask the following question, right? Um, how much, how much, basically what I want to do is I want to do this kind of prediction problem, right? I have time, I have volume, number of mentions of a particular piece of information, and I'd like to say how popular will this be in the future, right? So that's sort of, you can think of this as a time series prediction problem. I want to predict what will happen um, um, 
on the right. Okay, and um, what I the way how I can think about this, if I think about this in the context of networks, then I can think of this as a sort of a piece of information spreading over the nodes uh, of the network, right, along the edges. So I could think that you know nodes get in some sense infected, or I, they adopt the information and they spread it to their neighbors. And I could think of uh, that similar kind of process takes place um, in this online setting, where where um, where uh, the information propagates from a node to node over the network. The problem um, that is that in in this particular setting, I don't really have access to the network. Especially if I if I work with mainstream media, they don't they don't create links to one another. So I don't really have the network. And then the other um, and then the idea is that that how I can sort of solve this problem is 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 the following, right? I can say, okay, I will try to predict the future number of mentions, the future volume of a particular phrase based on who got um, what I will call, uh, what I will say is infected in the past, right? Sort of which media mentioned this information in the past, right? And this is sort of the connection with my previous graph because I said that depending on when the different media sites mention the information, I get different popularity curves. So now what I want to do is I want to say, okay, who mentioned the information in the past? Based on this, I want to predict what will happen to the information in the future, okay? Is it clear? Yeah, cool. Okay, so um, again, what I want to do, I want to predict how much information, how much attention, how much volume will a piece of information get in the future. Um, and again, sort of a simple, um, a cartoonish way to think about this would be the following, right? So I, I, I get to see who mentioned the information and at what point in time, right? So different media sites mention information at different points in time. And what I'd like to do now, I'd like to predict how many media sites will mention information at hour number four or at hour number five and so on. And the way, the way I will do this is by asking uh, this question, right? Sort of if I would like sort of to estimate what's the contribution of a particular website to the total popularity of a particular uh, piece of information, right? So I could almost say if New York Times mentions a piece of information at a particular time t, how many additional mentions, how much popularity of this, this information will this in some sense generate um, you know, on other websites at time t plus one, t plus two, t plus three, right? It's almost like saying if I could get New York Times to say something, how much attention will this buy me? You know, at the next time step and so on in the future. Okay, so that's um, that's what I'd like to build into my model. Um, so right, so really, my idea is that I want to predict the attention based on who mentioned the information in the past. And I'll show you this model. We will call it a linear influence model, where the idea will be that we will try to uh, capture exactly this idea of how much attention does New York Times buy you over time. For every, uh, for every, and we'll estimate this for every website, and then we will be able to predict the future uh, future volume of the information just by who mentioned it in the past. Um, and the good things here are we don't really uh, require the notion of the network, um, so everything will be kind of very simple. Okay, so here is the here's the idea. So now I will sort of set up the model, and then I'll also tell you how to estimate it from the data. Okay. So what do I want to do? So imagine that right now I have just one piece of information that, I, that I'd like to work with, right? So I have this x of t, which is the volume, number of mentions of this information as a function of time. Um, I have this m of t, which is what I will sort of call newly infected nodes at time t, right? So this would be all the websites that mentioned the information at time t. And then I have this a of t, which are all the nodes that mentioned information up to time t, right? It's just the union over all time steps before my time t. Okay, cool. So now I have this. Uh, what would I like to do? So what I would like to do is I'd like to predict the number of uh, mentions at some future time, at time t plus one, right? I'm at now at time t. I'd like to have to say what will happen in the next time step. What will be the volume in the next time step, right? And the way I will do this prediction is the following. I will assume that every media site, let's call it node, has a influence function associated with it, okay? And what do I mean by influence function is just, just some kind of notion of, um, of how much, how much, um, how many additional mentions does a particular node generate in the future? And I'm talking about this all at the level of correlations, right? So this should really be in quotation marks, right? So, um, and the, the intuition is, right, 
after node u gets infected, how many other nodes tend to get in the infected in the future? And if I'm able to estimate this kind of influence functions, I'll tell you how to, esti how to estimate them from the data, then I can predict how popular will a particular piece of information be in the future based, based on the values of these functions that I estimate on some historic data. Okay? So um, here is here's the idea, right? So for every for every website, I want to have some kind of function that says this is how many mentions does this website u generate as a function of time, where when time zero means this is the time when you mentioned my piece of information. Right? So one intuition would be to say, you know, the influence function of CNN would really say how many sites tend to mention this piece of information one hour, two hours, three hours later after the CNN uh, mentions it. Okay? Um, and I will be using past data to figure out what these functions, how these functions look like. Right? And once I have these functions, then I can predict the future volume, volume by simply sort of summing up these influence functions together, and that tells me what is the volume in the future. Um, so this was so here is here's a little picture how to how to do this. And now I hope everything will be clear, right? So what do I have? I have volume, number of mentions as a function of time. What I'd like to do, I'd like to predict how popular will be the information at this future time. Um, what I also know is that you know there are these three websites, UV and W, that mention the information at these particular time points. For each of these um, websites, I have an associated influence function. Somehow I will figure it out later. For now, let's just assume I have it, right? So this is, you know, this is New York Times influence as a function of time. This is when New York Times mentioned my information. I have this other website that has a different influence function and some other website with a different one. So now the question is, what's my prediction for the volume here? I can just go and um, sum these influence functions at this time point, add them up, that's my prediction. Okay? Sort of su super simple, right? I'm just saying, I know that these are the websites that mention the thing in the future, in the past. These are how their influences decay as a function of time. So if I want to predict something in the future, I'll just take the, sum the summation of the appropriately aligned influences, sum them up, that's my prediction. Okay? So um, this is exactly what I say here, right? I go over all the websites that got in infected in the past. I take their influence functions, different influence functions sort of start at different times. They start at the time when a particular site men mentioned the information. I add these things up, that's my prediction. Okay? So now the question is, how do I figure out these guys? Um, and um, here is how I can go basically figure them out. I can, at the end, what will happen is I will just have a simple least squares problem to solve. Okay? So what do I want to do, right? I want to figure out the shape of these uh, of these influence functions, right? So really, I want to. Um, this is what I want to solve, and the way I want to solve this is that I want to minimize the amount of error, right? So this is the the true volume in the future. This is my predicted volume in the future. I'd like to make my prediction to be as close to the future thing. I take the square, so the derivatives look nice. I I sum over all the all the times time points and all different pieces of information, right? All different quotes. So now I don't work with just one time series, but I work with multiple time series, right? And there are two things that I will, that I need to tell you before this will work, right? So the first thing to, te to tell you is how do I, how do I model the shape of these guys, right? And the way I will model the shape of these things is I will, I will, I will just think of them as a, as a vector of numbers. Right? So I won't assume any kind of parametric form. I will just assume that my influence functions have a, have a, are composed as a vector of numbers. Right? So really, instead of thinking of them as some kind of continuous quantity, I will think of them first as having finite support. Right? The influence goes to zero after some capital L number of steps. Think of L as 24 hours or something. And then the other thing I'll do is, instead of thinking them as some kind, some kind of continuous thing, I'll think of them as having this kind of discrete values, right? And this is L1, this is, this is L1, this is, uh, um, sorry, I of 1, this is I of 2, and so on, right? So really, what I want to do is, for every, for every website, for every node u, I want to figure out this capital L of numbers, right? And the way, the way I figure out these numbers, is to solve this least squares like looking problem, right? So here are the numbers I want to figure out. These are my least squares coefficients, if you like. These are my different time series. These are my different time points along that time series. That's the value of the time series in the future. That's my prediction, 
right? These are, these are sort of the coefficients that I add up, the values that I add up to, uh, to compare against uh, the ground truth, take the square. It turns out that this is really least squares, so I can just, you, you can just plug this in to your favorite um, least square solver. There's a good one in MATLAB and you get your solution out. Yes? I mean, you are making assumptions about that function then, right? I mean, you're assuming, for example, that all the function heights are independent, effectively. I mean, wouldn't you be better off assuming some sort of smoothness and using, for example, a Gaussian process? Or? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. So what I'm, the, the, in some sense, the assumption here is that there is no assumption, like that there is no relation between the value here and the value there, right? So I sort of constrain the model the least. What do I do in reality is to add a little penalty term here that um, tries to sort of account for smoothness, right? You can sort of have some kind, almost like a regularization term that we account that these things are sort of smooth. And in practice, you added that. Does that make sense? Sure. Okay. Yeah, so, uh, yeah. Uh, if we assume that this is uh, spreading in a network, but we just can't observe it, um, shouldn't you take into account the directionality of information? Like, where, uh, like for example, the three, assuming the three websites you um, um, gave out in the previous <coughs> Uh, are connected somehow, shouldn't the order in which they mention it uh, impact their own influence function? For example, it's going from one place to another in the network and in the other case it's going in a different direction? So here, so that's a good point. Um, I'll show you how to infer the network in a few slides. Okay. okay? So now, now I'm sort of assuming there is no network, um, you, don't, you don't have any kind of position in the network or whatever, you have this kind of global influence. Okay? Um, and you know, I can go figure out this influence function, solve this least squares problem, everything is good. And here is a simple, first question is how good, what is, how good is the predictive performance of this thing? So here's the experiment we did. We took thousand most popular quotes in a one year time period, right? And then these quotes got mentioned 372,000 times over, um, over, uh, over the universe of 16,000 websites. And then I built my model on by using only 100 influence functions, right? So the idea is I want to predict the, the attention a quote got over the universe of 16,000 websites by just observing when um, 100 different websites mentioned that quote, right? So I'm using 100 websites um, as a, to be able to predict what happened in the universe of 16,000 websites, okay? So it's kind of a hard, hard version of the problem, right? Um, and what I can do now is I can compare these to standard time series prediction models, right? Where, where I just say I will fit some kind of linear function to the time series and say what will happen in the future. And I'm, what I'm showing you here is error reductions, right? Sort of the, the higher the number, the better. Um, and the observation is the following. When I have sort of phrases that have this kind of uh, bursty patterns that sort of vary a lot as a function of time, we do really well, right? So we, we beat this. Um, time series regression models by what, a factor of two or three, right? Um, almost three, right? But then for smooth phrases, right, the, the time series regression will do a good job. And here we do a bit worse. But over all kinds of phrases, we do about factor two better than what standard time series regression would do, right? So what this is saying is that model is actually able to feed the data relatively well or better than what some sort of simple baselines would do. The other thing you can do is actually now you can go and take a look at these influence functions, right? So what I will show you here is, is uh, this idea where we took um, five different types of media, the same as I had before. So we, we f for each of these type of media, we found um, you know, a few newspapers, a few professional blogs, a few TV, TV station websites. And then we also classified quotes into topics. Uh, the way this classification was done, you basically look at the URL, many, many newspapers have, you know, newyorktimes.com uh, slash sports, right? So whatever happens afterwards, that's all in sports. So that's how, how these categories were derived. And what I can now do is I can train my model for each, um, for each different category. And I can also train my model and then average the influence functions for every uh, media, sort of for every type of media. And what do I get is this kind of curves where this is time and this is influence, this means um, how many additional mentions does a website generate, um, you know, in the same hour, one hour later, two hour later, and so on. And I can do this for, let's say, business and uh, entertainment. And I see these kinds of things that, um, depending on the topic uh, for business in, partic in, in particular, I see this, uh, that news agencies are the main drivers of attention, but then the, then the influence decays very quickly. While, for example, for the entertainment, I see it's much more blogs 
and TV, and they have they have some influence even further down into the future, right? So this is number of hours. You see that things sort of go to zero relatively quickly, but then in entertainment they stay above zero um, for quite a while. So that's really um, um, what you can use this model for. You can use it both for prediction and actually looking at these things to get some insights. Um, let me now tell you the last thing, and here I'll be quick and I'll have to skip a few things. So the, the next thing I'd like to ask is really if, I, if I'm interested in measuring the information flows, then what do I really see, right? What do I see is something like this. I have my universe of websites, and then I see, uh, you know, at what particular times websites mentioned information. So this would be, you know, there is a, a red story, and this is how the red story got mentioned on the web. And then maybe there is some blue piece of information, and this is how the blue piece of information got mentioned in the web. Right? So all I get to see is the, the times when websites mentioned information. What I don't get to see is sort of who copied from whom. Right? So if my, my assumption is that the information flows through the network, the question is really what's the network. Right? So what do I really, so the problem is I only get to see the times when websites mentioned information, but I don't see who, who got it from whom. So what would I like to do is I would really like to reconstruct this hidden or unobserved diffusion network. So here is, here's the model, right? So the idea is the following. I have a network that I don't get to see, okay? So I just see nodes. But then I have, um, I get basically to see the times when nodes get infected. So the way I can think about this is to say, okay, there is this yellow piece of information that node A first uh, said it, and then I got C to say it, and then B said it, and then E said it, right? So all I get to see is I say, for the yellow piece of information, cascade C1, <coughs> these are the nodes, and these are the times when nodes got infected, right? And then I can say, okay, and there is this blue piece of information, and that spread over this network somehow, and all I got to see, get to see is uh, who are the nodes that got infected and at what times they got infected. My goal is to figure out what is the network over which the information propagated to create this kind of sequence of infection times, right? So really, the way I can think about this is that, is that I have a static network and I have some kind of dynamic process unfolding over the network. I don't get to see who uh, spread the information or who infected whom. I just get to see the infection times, right? So in terms of virus propagation, I could think that I have a uh, underlying social network over which a virus like flu propagates. I only get to observe the times when people get sick, but I don't get to see who who transmitted the, the disease to whom. So basically who, who cough, who was, you know, who transmitted, which edges transmitted the disease of the network. I'd like to figure out what's the underlying network. Or I could do uh, the same thing, the same problem is if, if I think about this as viral marketing or word of mouth type of setting where I have recommendations being made over the edges of the network from a friend to friend. I only observe when people go and make purchases, but I don't get to see who made the recommendation to whom. The question is, in both cases, what's the underlying network over which a virus or purchases of a particular product propagated? Um, and the, the results I'll show you today will be about um, inferring networks of information diffusion. We actually had data about viral marketing, and there we were able to infer the networks uh, really exactly. So um, it worked really well, okay? So let me just tell you how, how one can go think about this problem, okay? So what do I want to do? Um, I'm, given, um, I'm given a set of, let's call them infection times C, right? So for every piece of information, I have this set of node and the time when the node got infected. I have, um, and I have this for, you know, for every different disease or for every different piece of information. I'd like to find a graph that best explains this observed data, right? So I can naturally formulate this as a, as a maximum likelihood type of problem, right? I, I want to say, given a graph, how likely was my graph to produce this set of uh, cascades um, uh, that, that I get to see in the real world, right? So what I'd like to do is basically I'd like to, I'd like to find a graph that best explains my observed data. Right? So if I want to find a graph that best explains my, my observed data, I need to have some kind of model of how data was generated, right? how inf uh, t in, uh, infections transmitted or how information transmitted through the network. Whoops, sorry. So the way, the way I can do this is the following. Here are sort of the ingredients I need to my model. 
right? So the first thing I need is to say how likely is a particular node to have infected some other node, right? So, and the way you can think about this is to say if I mention information and then you tend to mention it very quickly after me, then is a, there's a high likelihood of us being connected. If I mention it and you mention it three, three weeks later, then there is probably no connection between us. That's, you know, a good uh, version zero of the intuition to have. Is the question how likely was this guy to infect or influence this other guy? Once I have this formulated, the second thing I need to be able to do is to ask, okay, now how likely was my information to spread in a particular pattern, right? And the thing is there may be multiple different patterns, different cascade graph uh, consistent with the set of infection times. So I really need to consider all of them. And once I have this, now I need to specify something even more complex. I need to be able to say, okay, but now how likely was this blue um, transmission, gra uh, transmission graph or cascade to, to have occurred in my, in my social graph G, right? So I have the probability of you, infect, uh, you influencing V. I have the probability of a particular set of infection times occurring in a particular tree pattern T. Once I have the tree pattern, I, then I can ask how likely was this to occur in my graph. And once I have, I have um, the probability of how likely was a particular cascade to, infer, to occur in my graph, then I can ask, okay, how likely were all the cascades to infer in my graph, uh, to occur in my graph? So why is this hard? Um, here are two reasons why this is hard. So the first thing is, it's not even clear how to efficiently compute sort of the score, right? So if you give me a graph and you tell me here is a set of cascades, how likely is this to happen? So Computing this is non-trivial, right? It's just sort of, you give me a concrete graph, you give me the data and you tell me how compatible is this graph with the data I observe. So this is non-trivial, but really we want to solve even a harder problem, right? So even if I know how to evaluate the quality of a single graph, what I really want to find is I want to find the best graph, right? The, the graph that best explains my data. Um, so what I want to do is I want to find a graph that maximizes this scoring function. And right, this is kind of, super hard, right? Because if you ask, okay, how many different graphs do I have to search over? I have to search over sort of two to the n squared, right? Where n is the number of nodes um, uh, or, uh, or number of graphs, right? So, so you, this, is, this is, you can't compute this for more than maybe three or four nodes, right? So really um, the question is how can you do this? And um, I won't really tell you how, but I can tell you that you can do it. And you can do it in polynomial time. So you can really do it instead of doing this, maximi finding the G that maximizes this in two to the n time, you can do this in order n squared. So basically you, you can forget about this two here. And the even cooler thing is that you can prove that the graph you will find won't be, won't be bad. It will be almost as good as the optimal graph. So you can do something approximately very quickly and you can prove that whatever you will do, that won't be too bad. And what do I mean by it won't be too bad? It won't, it won't be, uh, it will be at most sort of 63% away from the optimal graph, right? So it will be a constant factor away from the optimal graph. Now I have to jump a few slides and I'll just show you how well this works, okay? So, um, here is, here's maybe the, the experiment to, to tell you, right? So here is the setting where we will apply this. So I'll again take my mean tracker data, one year, 170 million documents, uh, 350 million quotes, and I will just record times when a particular website mentioned a particular piece of information. And what I'd like to do now is I'd like to be able to infer what is the underlying network that would explain how information propagated between these websites. Right? So my assumption is that the way the, the nodes get to hear about the information is that they hear about it from their neighbors. The question is, how does the information spread through the network? And um, if I go in for these sites, uh, here is a small version of the graph on uh, 5,000 new sites. Blue are blogs, red are, red are the mainstream media sites. Um, looks interesting, but you don't see much. But the interesting thing is if you actually go and zoom in into this network, right? So if I take the same data, but just zoom in, to particular part of it, here is the, here's sort of the graph I get, right? So these are different websites, um, edges, um, edges point in the direction of information um, diffusion. And what you see here is you have this kind of three interesting clusters. You have this cluster of um, political, uh, political blogs or political newspapers. You have this cluster of entertainment related um, sites and you have uh, technology down here, right? Um, 
sort of gadgets and things like that, right? But what is interesting then is also what are the positions different nodes occupy in this network, right? And for example, you have the Huffington Post here that's deeply embedded in this political cluster. You have, for example, Salon.com, which is a online newspaper in US that that uh, tries also be to try to be a bit more technologically oriented. So there is this connection to the technology cluster. Um, people here are aware of Guardian, and there is this connection to the to the celebrity part um, or sort of entertainment part of the of the of the of the media space. You have Washington Post here, U.S. News down there, and so on. Right. So so what is interesting is that this allows you to see what are sort of the roles or positions in the in the information diffusion network of the websites in a case where you don't see um, the network itself. Of information, how do you quantify the dynamics this uh, attention information gets um, as a function of time? Then we had this model about predicting um, uh, the diffusion of information and about inferring networks um, of um, information transmission. And I think really the, the, next, the interesting next step here is really to think about what about opinion dynamics, right? If I understand how something spreads, how does sort of the sentiment or opinion attached to a piece of information, how does that spread, right? And there is this very nice paper by, by uh, Lada Damich and Natalie Glenz about the political blogosphere and how liberal and conservative blogs link to each other and so on. Or I should say, don't link to each other, right? So what you could do in, in terms of similar line of work is start talking about, um, you know, how does the, the information change or how does the attitude sentiment against towards information change as the information propagates? And just to show you a result of a simple experiment, here is, um, here is what we did, and I'll, I'll end with this, right? So, so going back to my first idea of how can I trace the information flow, I can sort of have this uh, hyperlinks between blogs, which means that this blog linked to this other um, uh, blog. And then uh, what I can do is for every for every blog, I can compute its baseline sentiment. Just think of, I just ask what is the average number of positive words and the ne num average number of negative words that I see in a, in a post coming from this blog. And then I can start talking about what I will call subjectivity, which is sort of what's the deviation from your baseline sentiment, right? So every website has some baseline sentiment. Some, people, some sites are more positive, some are more negative. And then I'm measuring the deviation from this baseline. And then the, question, the first question I can ask is, you know, does the sentiment really flow? Which means if this guy is more positive than usual, are these guys also more positive than usual or not? Okay, so that's the first question. So here's the answer to the first question. That's the subjectivity of the parent. That's the subjectivity of the child. What this says is when, when the top guy gets more negative, then the children are more negative. And when the, when the parent gets more positive, the children are more positive, right? So there is some correlation. So that's, that indicates that sort of the sentiment flows, right? If I'm super excited, then people that link to me will be also more excited than what they usually are, right? These are all uh, relative to the baseline. And then the other thing I can now ask is also I can ask, not just what's the relation between the child and the parent, but I can ask how does, how does sentiment change as the cascade grows, right? As the information propagates from here all the way down. And what you see is that cascades start with sort of zero at the baseline level, but then very early you get this um, deviation in, in, um, in, um, in, um, in subjectivity. So I'm plotting here one minus subjectivity. So this means um, the, the people get um, there is this deviation in the, in the sentiment from the baseline and then goes back, right? So what this is trying to say is that cascades heat up very early and then sort of slowly return back to their, uh, to their normal state. This is just sort of uh, two cases what you can do when you j not just saying how can I trace the flow of information, but also how could I start reasoning about polarization, um, you know, maybe bring in networks of positive and negative relationships um, and try to figure out how do opinions form in these online networks. So um, with this, um, I will start um, and I'll be very happy to take questions. Maybe I can just ask one question just right on this last slide, which um, it would be useful to know how the sample size changes over in depth because there are a lot of um, cascades that are, are much shorter mm -hmm. than, and actually getting cascades that have quite a number of a, a depth to them seem much rarer in, in the initial data. So 
uh, good point. So we have these plots in the paper. So there are two things that you have to you have to know here. So the first thing is that yes, the number of cascades of particular depth decreases drastically as you get from here down to there. But the other thing to note is that the sort of cascades are this kind of tree-like structure. So even if the total number of cascades decreases as they get deeper, the number of nodes at a particular particular level increases with the, with the level. So you get quite a, few, uh, quite a lot of observations here. Sure. Um, but good point, I don't have those plots there in the paper. Thank you. Is that the same axis on the right as on the left? So the 0 0.01, is that comparable to a difference of 0 0.01 in the axis on the left? Um, I would... I don't see a reason why it wouldn't be. Is there a problem? No, I'm, I'm just trying to work I out. I think it is. Problem. Let's say my answer now, it, it is. OK, I'm just trying to work out if there, these are significant differences on the right, whether or not there's actually like a significant trend in the you know, sentiment difference as a function of cascade depth. And I mean, it doesn't seem like it's that significant. It goes up to like 0 0.01, which is. Oh, um, um, really, what I'm. Um, um, the way the way to think about this is i don't really have a like the in the absolute okay good point so um okay so one way to think about this is to say that i think the way we did this is that this is in the units of standard deviations right sort of you could think of this as this course right and if that's the case then yes, these are relatively small numbers. Um, but what we also did is we were trying to see um, what, are, what are the deviations of these z scores over the, over the populations. And I think in, our, in the paper, we actually have this with, um, with the, error in some bars. sense, error bars attached to, to here. But that's a good point. I, I've got a few, uh, but so I'll just uh, I'll go with say perhaps a uh, a small one would be uh, dealing with uh, time heterogeneity in the um, uh, in sort of the, the previous work um, and inferring the network uh -huh. where um, I mean obviously it's um, time heterogeneous for every snapshot, but I mean some websites rise in prominence and others fall and. Um, would such would building in such time heterogeneity other than obviously complicating the model uh, in, improve the fit? But beyond that, and that's just me sort of thinking or reflecting more broadly on what is the underlying network? And this is not really a network of attention per se, but a network of discussion. Um, if one was to reweight these things by say the number of people who see this, because yes, you say early on the talk, oh, I exclude Twitter, well you exclude Twitter and Facebook and talking around the water cooler and, and everything else that you didn't collect mm -hmm. suggests that there is still, there is, a, there is, a, there is ultimately the attention uh, network, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. which you're catching a slice of it. So um, how is it possible to model the people who are consuming this rather than the people who are reproducing this in such a way that you can now say this is an intention network rather than this is a network that's going to, this is a message propagation network. Uh, good point. So what we were also trying to do, but then we dropped, so maybe I'll, I'll give a few answers. So the first thing is we were looking sort of, what is interesting if you look at the, uh, so we were looking at this, um, the number of quotes or articles or whatever that we get as a function of time. And even like over one year, that's pretty much flat. You get this kind of weekly periodicity, but that's all you get. So it seems sort of the amount of content that, that is being produced or the number of quotes, the number of articles, um, the number of hyperlinks, it's basically flat as a function of time. So it almost seems like the bandwidth of the, of the web is constant as a function of time. So that is interesting because when I showed these graphs here at the beginning, um, maybe, you know, this guy, right? The, the amount of stuff generated by the web is it's like a river. It's about constant as, all, all the time, right? But then you see that you have this kind of spikes in attention when it seems that people sort of, they go talk about, everyone is minding their own business, and then they talk about this for a bit, and then they go mind their own business, they come together, talk about this, and then they diverge again. So, so that's uh, the first answer. The second answer is this, this distinction between um, sort of people mentioning things versus consuming them. Um, what we were trying to do here was um, 
was there is Alexa, which is sort of measuring popularity of every website. And what we wanted to do is we wanted to sort of assign weights to websites by their Alexa rank. The problem was that all these blogs and everything, you don't even find these things there. So, so they are really good at capturing the, the, the attention, the sort of the big sites get, but we didn't have nothing on the small side. So that's why we decided to say volume sort of equals in, or is a proxy for, for attention, even though many more people see the information than the ones that actually copy it or talk about it and so on. So, so I... But there must be a way to sample blogs of different sizes to give a distribution to, or shape to that distribution that's not simply linear. I mean, do, do smaller blogs have proportionately more readers for every piece of information that gets forwarded than, um, than large blogs? Um, or something to that, or is that in fact constant? I mean, if that's constant, then there's a there's kind of a really neat universal social media constant of, for every retweet there is X number of followers that didn't retweet, or for every, you know, reblog there is X number of people who didn't reblog. But if that varies by size, then there's some, you know, I, so real funny assumptions you have to make to talk about this as attention versus just um, retweeting. I think that's a what I think what you say is a really good point. I'm not sure where you'd be able to get reliable data to be able to estimate this. But so here is one little anecdotal example that what we were looking. We were trying to look at, um, you know, uh, on the Twitter, um, what happens when sort of Lady Gaga tweets something versus um, when somebody of smaller degree tweets that. And there are two things. One is what's the absolute number of retweets you cause, and then how deep things do you do you create and and maybe interestingly it happens that sort of lady gaga has lots of followers and when she says something there is a buzz but that buzz is like you know sort of unimportant people follow her so you in terms of um, right in terms of things um, spreading you don't you don't get much so people that have around 1000 or let's say thousands of followers they around them you really get to see network effect which is kind of similar to what Duncan Watts has been saying mm -hmm. for the last couple of years. So I think the issues you are bringing up, I think, are very important. Um, for some of the things, we sort of had to make these assumptions because the, the basically, yeah, because the data that you can get is, is what you can get in some sense. Google, hit-wise. I mean, there's analytics. There, somebody must have this data. I think everyone has it, but it's not collected <laughs> in a in a centralized yeah, uh, centralized way. Proprietary. Yeah, sure. uh, but I mean, you, you well, thank like you. yeah. If I can get another one. Thank you for the presentation. By the way, I think a lot of, of great things um, follow up, particularly in the networks. Is uh, I hadn't seen that paper and need to, to look at it. But I have a, a sort of follow up, uh, similar to Bernie's, and it's sense of the underlying assumptions of what the networks are, particularly um, right at the beginning when we're looking at the, the different structures of networks that emerge. And I'm wondering what the evidence is that people link directly to the source from which they first discovered content versus linking to a larger source where it is. So Bernie blogs a story on The Guardian. I read it on Bernie's blog, but do I link to Bernie or do I link directly to The Guardian? Uh -huh. um, and of course, we can only observe the hyperlinks in the end. But I was wondering if you have any idea, anecdotally or background or other papers that have that give us a better sense that the hyperlinks are actually corresponding to the the information flow. So, actually, let me show you because you get you get exactly what you are talking about, right? So you get things like this, mm -hmm. right? And this is really like you know these guys. The things here really go up all the way um, to to citing, or you get this kind of in some sense triads where things go both to the to the person where they probably got it and all the way up by by following these hyperlinks. Mm -hmm. So, I think in the early blogosphere, the idea was that you sort of give credit to the to the source and you give or you give credit to where you learned it and you give credit to the to the root. Mm -hmm. um, but I think afterwards this. Um, didn't really work out. So um, I don't really have a good answer. And I haven't seen a study lately that would try to say, 
when people create mm -hmm. links, who do they who do they really um, who do they really link to, right? Sure. All, all again here, I like I was trying to be pragmatic in some sense and say one way to see where how the information went was to there must have been a good reason for you to create a link. Now, mm -hmm. now, of course that's interesting because then the question is why do you know? What, what, like, do these things really happen, or is this thing really a that thing, right? right? Is this really that, but just somebody didn't give the give the credit to the right person? Mm -hmm. um, I would imagine that um, people. Um, what we also find is that dif like the different cascades have very different um, sort of different topics have different cascades, and what we found was when we were looking this for different um, sites, we saw that, for example, technology websites they were creating things like this. But then um, the political blogs were creating things like that, sort of narrower but deeper, which also, at least anecdotally, seemed to make uh, to make some sense. So I think there is a lot to be to be done here. But I, more, I wanted to show it as an example of where you can actually get some kind of explicit notion of mm -hmm. where the things came from. Thank you. Oh, oh okay, good. Yeah, all of, yeah. strong assumption that you can have sort of a constant influence function for a given website irrespective of the nature of the story or, 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 or the source. And so, I mean, for example, if you have, if you're looking at the influence function of the New York Times, for instance, it might be quite different depending on if it was something that Barack Obama said versus something that Mitt Romney said, for instance. There are all, all sorts of biases that might be there. And given the actual data that you had and the functions you fit, uh, I mean, did you sort of look at the error bars on those functions? Basically, how how much, how how good really is the assumption that you can have a consistent influence function across all the stories? Uh, I think that's an excellent that's an excellent point. And really, in some sense, what what you can do, and in some sense, what we did here was was the same thing, right? So so what I was showing you before for the pre for, so for the prediction um, for this experiment, I train one influence function across everything. Right, so I'm as naive as possible. Right, while for these experiments, I would basically for every topic, New York Times would get would get to choose a different influence function. So you can, in some sense, you can go and and um, 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 go and um, estimate these things on a per topic basis. And we found that you get, of course, right, sort of better performance in prediction if you do this. On a per topic basis, right? So um, I think you are right that there is there is more like you can you can make these things arbitrarily more complicated or more complex, right? The other thing that you can say is if I go back to this picture, right? Um, here, right? Like the influence function will be different where you whether you were very early to mention or you were very late to mention because naturally the attention the the freshness of information will drop and in the paper we have different versions of the model where you also can account for this kind of different factors that that obviously play some role and yeah you get you know your models work a bit better but it doesn't seem it didn't seem to be something really core that you need for these things to start working. So maybe that's that's the answer I'd give. But you are completely right that there is lots of sort of I showed you the most simple and the most naive version um, of the model. And but it's very easy, like the whole thing is so simple that it's very easy to throw more stuff in and you know solving least squares or skiing down the slope is always easy. Yeah. Um, I would also be curious about um, your inference of the of the link structure, not from the hyperlink data, but from the main data. Uh -huh. So um, are you aware of any literature that has uh, pro uh, done the, th the same thing you did, uh, but with uh, work on causality to, uh, as a pre-processing step to reduce the number of uh, possible graph structures that are consistent with your observations? I think that, I mean, intuitively, that should reduce your problem drastically. Uh -huh. uh, good. Let me tell you the following. So one way how we tested our method was the following. We said, let's observe the times when sites mention information. Mm -hmm. And let's try to predict who links to whom. So we took these hyperlink cascades. We said, those are the ground truth. This is how information spread. And then we said, let's just sort of get to see the times when different websites woke up and said, oh, I'm creating a hyperlink. I'm creating a hyperlink, right? Can I infer the underlying hyperlink network? And we were able to do that with like, 
break-even points, so precision recall of around 0.7, yes. which I thought was really good. Mm -hmm. um, on synthetic data, we were trying to do these things where we have the network, we simulate propagation, throw away the network, try to infer the network. If we have about two propagations over the edge, we can infer that edge. Mm -hmm. So in some sense, we need um, relatively little data to be, to be able to do this. Um, now, for the network inference part, I didn't really tell you how the algorithm, what is the algorithm, right? But here's, sorry, I'll show you the algorithm because it's so simple. Uh, uh -huh, here's the algorithm, right? So it's really, it's really this kind of greedy hill climbing. I start with an empty graph and then I say, what's the best edge I can throw into my graph to make more graph more explanatory, right? right. I find the best edge, I throw it into my graph. Now I have a graph with one edge and I say, what's the next best edge I can throw in to explain the most of my data? And I keep doing this, uh -huh. okay? Uh -huh. And then I can prove that my objective function is submodular in the edges of G and because it's submodular, then you know, there is, the, there is the, this famous result by Nemhauser et al that this will be um, one minus one over E of the optimal solution, mm -hmm. right? And then we have these online bounds and I can actually that sort right. of show that this is good and so on. But this is really my algorithm at the end, right. right? So I'm really sort of starting with an empty graph and then keep throwing in edges and right. try to explain the most of the data I get. Okay. Does that make sense what I said? It, I mean, it, it makes sense and, and it does look so I'm not really to IC star in a way. I don't know if you know it, if you ever ventured into the philosophy department at CMU, uh, the Tetra group, they have come up with all these algorithms. Some of them are a bit similar, except that they test for independencies uh -huh. uh, to, to get rid of edges. But, but so, so the question was, are you aware of any connections between these two, uh, between your application domain and the causality guys? No, honestly, not really. The other really, the, the other really connection here is to the graphical model structure learning. Right, which, right? which is again. Um, which is related to, 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 to the, yes. to, to, to what those guys are doing. Okay. Um, we thought about that a bit, but we were not able to find a good connection. So right. maybe you are, or maybe you know that right. side of the world better than we did. A little bit, yeah. Um, but it's really, it's really, yeah, it's basically you are trying to learn this kind of graphical model that explains right. this kind of diffusion yeah, yeah, process sure. on top of it. Okay. Okay, yeah, thanks a lot for bearing and surviving. Thank you.